digital journalist at Tiso Black Star Group, which is the newspaper group that basically handles Sunday Times, Financial Mail, Sowetan, Times Live. Using Rule 3512, which is typically in, in cases where, for instance, I'm suing you and I make reference to some disparaging email that you sent me and it's not in my court papers, and you turn around and say, well, I want to see this email, and then I provide it. But in the context of this, it's quite strange that this is the route that the president's lawyers have, have, have chosen to go. And I think a lot of people interpreting this as a potential delaying tactic. Also extremely strange that the DA is now saying no, uh, that the, the president is now saying the DA must explain where this report came from, who wrote it, um, and, and provide the full document of which we've seen Pravin Gordon at, at one of the press conferences waving a page. Mm. I mean, you really couldn't make this stuff up. I always knew I was going to be a journalist. I never, it never actually occurred to me since I was about 14 that this was not something that I was not going to do. I think journalism is something that when you are a journalist, there's literally nothing else that you can do. I think the big thing for me is that I'm insatiably, insatiably curious. So I always want to know why people do the things that they do or why they make the decisions that they do. I think you're constantly searching for an explanation and I think that's what drives um, good journalism. And I think that the thing that I've learned over and over again is that human beings will always surprise you. Don't think you know the story before you write the story or tell the story because human beings have very, very different motives uh, than what you imagine. Um, I went to Rhodes University when I was about 18 or 19. It was a very big decision for my mom to let me go because I'm a type 1 diabetic. Uh, we have, I have a life-threatening illness, meaning that sometimes I go into comas caused by low blood sugar and you can actually die quite easily. So for my mom it was like a big thing to say, okay, I'm gonna let, you know, I'm gonna let my daughter, who I've looked after since she was four and a half years old, which is when I was diagnosed. I'm going to let her go to university and, and she was very, very brave about it. Um, it was an incredible kind of four or five year period because I ended up doing an MA. I went to Sweden for a few months to finish my MA. Um, and during that time I started working at independent newspapers in Cape Town. And basically what happened was I started working there when I was 19. I sort of blabbed my way into a job and pretended I was way more experienced than I actually was. <laughs> Talked a lot of nonsense to people. Yeah, I sure I could do that. And then um, started working, you know, in the newsroom. It was it was fun. And um, started just doing everything, kind of every story. And then basically what happened was that the High Court reporter resigned very suddenly. And I was like this 22, 23 year old kid. And they were like, look, we need someone to do the High Court stories because that was where all the high profile murder cases and big civil matters were happening. So they sent me in there and I think the best thing that I learned from that experience is if you don't know, say you don't know. Because I would literally walk up to prosecutors and be like, I have no idea what the hell is going on, please help me. And then I would get numbers for advocates and phone them and I'd be like, I will read you out what I think happened and then you will tell me if it is right. And so I learned on the job and people were incredibly generous, other reporters as well, about teaching me. And I think that's given me a real sense of like how important it is when you have, you know, an understanding of a particular field to assist and help other people who are new to that field. I think that's real legacy is enabling other people to not have to struggle necessarily the same way you did because you're a kind of person who can help them. So I feel very passionately about that. Anyway, I was supposed to only be in that job for four weeks. Four years later, I was still doing it. I'd been on CNN talking about Mark Thatcher, done all these high profile cases. I then got offered a job at the Star, came to the Star in Joburg, did the Zuma rape case, uh, did the Zuma corruption stuff, broke the story about the NPA dropping charges against the Zuma, which was the worst two weeks of my life because everyone denied it. And I was like, please, Lord in heaven, let me not be wrong because otherwise this is going to be embarrassing and I think that's one of the, the hallmarks a lot of the time of being a journalist is you literally just going please let me not be wrong a lot of the time. Um, then I got offered a job at ENCA, 
I think that was a very humbling experience because television is really, really, really hard. Um, you know, writing a script that's one and a half minutes requires a lot of work, um, a lot of effort. And I think once you're in there and you realize that, I've, I've got a huge amount of respect for my broadcast colleagues. Um, I think it was that in, in that space that people really got to know me. Um, did a lot of high profile cases, Oscar Pistorius, Glenn Agliotti, all those kind of things. Um, and then, you know, obviously all the Zuma cases, all the various bad Jacob Zuma decisions which were reversed, all of them in court, in Kandla, spy tapes, public protectors reports. Um, so it was a really eventful eight years of my life and then I, I resigned and went back into newspapers and freelancing. Now I do stuff for Al Jazeera, do stuff for SABC, do a lot of radio stuff. Um, and you know, kind of set my own diary in my own terms. I mean, I miss my NCA colleagues. I think they are a fantastic bunch of people. It's definitely the most loving newsroom I've ever worked in. You shouldn't found your identity on where you are. You should found your identity on who you are and what you're about. And who you are and what you're about should always be, you know, it shouldn't be attached to a particular organization. And I think that for me, just on its own, has been a very valuable lesson. It's a difficult question for me because I often feel like Women's Month, Women's Day, those kind of things are really kind of insubstantial, unsubstantial in terms of addressing the very real inequalities that continue to exist in our, fam in our, in our country and in our families oftentimes. Um, and yeah, there's a responsibility on us to support, love and encourage each other, but there's also a responsibility on us to start demanding explanations from men. What I would love to see in the coming months, weeks, years, is men who are abusers to come forward and, and really talk honestly about what they have done, because they aren't monsters, they are among us, they're people we know, people we work with. Um, people who are our friends, people who are oftentimes incredibly kind, decent people who have brokenness in their own lives and they can't talk about we it. We as women cannot change you. We can love you, we can support you. But in the end of the day, until you start as men and as leaders within your community and just ordinary people saying, I don't want to be part of this culture. I don't want this for my kids. I don't want my daughters to face the real prospect that if they date the wrong guy, they'll end up dead and you know, burning in a dustbin somewhere in a field, because that's what we're dealing with. Until we start demanding those kind of answers, that kind of action, Women's Month is just gonna be the same old stuff every single year. A lot of words that actually end up meaning nothing.